Father, make Christ more alive to us as we continue this journey of understanding who you are and our calling. Father, thank you. Thank you for all the gifts you have given and thank you for your spirit inside that sanctifies us and teaches us daily. That is the only way to grow is staying in your word and walking in step with him. Father, reveal to us areas in our heart that need to be cleansed that we may give them up to you and abandon and just turn them over to you. Father, I know that we're Father, speak to us this morning. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, this is exciting. Actually, <laughs> and of course, this is not, it's not a race through the New Testament not a race through Luke at all. Um, but we're coming to a point now where uh, Jesus, after confronting the Pharisees, showing that they are hypocrites in their belief, in their false religion that they've created, that they claim to have eternal life, they claim to have a relationship with God, they claim to um, be able to show other people the way, Jesus says, you're hypocrites. You, you, you are bankrupt. You are, you are destined to hell and taking all those with you. And judgment is upon your head. And he, and he, he was invited to dinner. And he gave them six cursings right off the bat. <laughs> and three woes, uh, a cursing. And when I read through that, it's like, Lord, reveal to me, I don't, I don't want to be a hypocrite. But then I read on, and I realize that um, Jesus is saying, any, any other religion, any other way to get to God outside of the true gospel of coming through me is false and is hypocritical. That's, it's blunt, but that's the truth. He's saying the father is of the devil, um, and he's talking to the most religious people out there that were the closest, I mean, studying the Old Testament scriptures, and yet they were far from the truth. And they were the closest to the truth, but the furthest from the truth, if that makes sense, of all the religions in the world. And so Jesus is coming against them, and so we come to Luke chapter 12, and if, if we look at this in context, Jesus is going to give a sermon now, and it's going to go from chapter 12, verse 1, all the way to chapter 13 and verse 9. So this is one long sermon he gives, and, and it's quickly on the heels of this conflict that just went on with the Pharisees. Because it starts out in verse 12. Meanwhile, you remember those words? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know, <laughs> that this is taking on, taking off right on the heels of uh, him in opposition with the Pharisees. Um, and he did not hold back at all, he released on them. And <clears throat> now for us, after hearing this condemnation of false religion and those who follow it, we have to ask ourselves, Am I, how, how do I not be a hypocrite? And Jesus is going to tell us how not to be a hypocrite right here in chapter 12. Because if you'll notice, it says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. Okay, Now there's a lot packed in this because when it says there's a crowd of many thousands, the largest 
largest figure in the Greek language is 10,000. And when they use it, it, the word is myrios, which we get myriad. You know, there's a myriad of angels. Um, it says there is myriads of myriads of angels. Back when, in, in earlier in Luke, when, um, when the proclamation was made of Christ's coming, it says there were 10,000 times 10,000. So that's their way of saying, there's a lot. There's many, many, many. And here, um, we're talking, this is a large gathering of 10,000 times 10,000, maybe larger. It's hard to fathom this, but we're talking 20, 30, 40,000 people. This is like the big event in Israel. Jesus is confronting the Pharisees, whom they've grown up with, understanding this religion, and having them watch over them and tell them when they were going wrong in their life and doing this to them constantly. That was the religious leaders. Um, and now thousands were gathering and so they were trampling on one another they're, they're that many people they're trying to get in close to hear what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees it's like what's going on this guy he's been doing all these miracles we've seen them happen and he's going head to head with them and they're all trying to get the front row seats to watch this and hear and get close and so they're trampling on each other to get close. But Jesus, notice this, he is, he is looking now to his disciples. And this word disciples, as we've learned, is methedes, which means students. Those who are still open and open to him, curious, listening, following him. And it's not just 12 disciples here, 12 apostles. We're talking about disciples. Every, everybody on that spectrum that is, who has been born again, have put, placed their faith in him as the Messiah already, all the way to those who are curious and kind of skeptical, but yet are still open. So we're talking about this whole realm of people there. And he turns and focuses on them. And he really what he's saying here is how not to be a hypocrite. How, how not to be a hypocrite. hypocrite. Hypocrite like these Pharisees. Okay? And <clears throat> he's, in, this, in this passage, um, we're going to see that um, he talks about judgment in this section. In verse 5, uh, he's going to say, Fear the one who can send cast you into hell um, 35 he warns them to be dressed in readiness because there's going to be coming in an hour the son of man um, and verse 49 he says I have come to bring fire he's going to talk about cutting them up being drug off to prison in verse 58 and in 13:7, if if no tree bears fruit it's going to get cut down so there's judgment in here. So these are warnings to these disciples to make up their mind. You, you've either got to come with me or join this other crowd that is hard-hearted, that um, are going to be judged. <clears throat> but it's one long sermon, and it's going to be interrupted twice. Somebody in the, in the crowd is going to stand up and interrupt. And then... Verse 41, Peter's going to interrupt this discussion. But it all goes on. 13, verse 1, it says on the same occasion. So it's continuing on till verse 9 in chapter 13. So he speaks to the disciples. And, and what is great, he... he He's, he's looking at this group, this small group here, who is, he calls them my friends in verse, verse, five, that's not where it is. Verse four, my friends. Um, he's going to speak to them. And then later on, um, where's 
to that. 30, verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock. Now he's saying little flock in this great mass of people. But he knows only a few are going to come. And little flock, it's just hard to comprehend, isn't it? That's what I was saying to Scott. I don't mind the size. This is great. Little flock. I get to talk about Jesus here. This is amazing. And it, it makes you think of the word disciple. Just because they were disciples following him, um, later on, John, he says in chapter 6 that many of his disciples no longer walked with him. They would find his words hard and they couldn't take it. They couldn't... They just walked away. And so disciples doesn't mean they're committed. Some are. Some are born again and understand. But others are... Um, just curious and, and waiting to see if he says something that's going to trigger. So he's warning them, but I want you to listen. And I want you to avoid hypocrisy. <clears throat> and he's going to do this by revealing three things to us. And it's brought out in this text. Um, the first thing is to honor God. Honor God, the Father. It's pretty complicated. Honor God the Father. The second is honor God the Son. <laughs> and third, what would you say it is? Spirit. Honor the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's, it's that basic. But he is bringing to them this truth that I am connected with God the Father. And I am connected with the Holy Spirit and that there is a trinity here. And that if you... Try to come to God and disregard the Trinity, you are lost. I just think of Unitarians that come to God. The Lord is one, and they just think He's one, God, God altogether. Or He's God having different roles, but, is, but Jesus is saying we're distinct people. Um, we are one and the same, the same nature, essence, and. This is going to keep you from hypocrisy. You will know the truth. And he starts out by saying, being on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So he's saying, do not let the Pharisees who, who are pretending this, to do all the right things and that they have a great relationship with God, do not listen to them. Do not listen to them. Because once you take that little bit of yeast, it gets in, and permeates through. That's, I don't know enough about cooking, but yeast or leaven in bread is uh, fermented old dough that is put into new, and once you put it in there, it permeates it, it, it and it enlarges. It, it, yeah, it grows, it grows. And so Jesus is like, don't even listen to him. You want to start off right? You want to be non-hypocritical? Non Don't listen to false teachers. And he points out the Pharisees as being the false teachers. Do not listen to them. And then he goes on to say, how do you honor God? How do you find the truth? And you begin in verse 2. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more, but I will show you whom you shall fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So, he's starting out with honoring God the Father. And if you truly know God, you would fear Him. 
If you want to approach God, you have to come in fear and honor. And he brings out three things in that. Okay? He brings out, number one, that nothing is hidden in God's sight. He, he sees everything. You have said in the dark, whatever you've said, whatever you think is hidden from him, it's going to be revealed. Nobody can pretend. He, he's saying these phony, fake, hypocritical Pharisees, they're walking around and pretending to be righteous, and yet what they do in their hearts is wicked. It's, what do you call it? Wickedness? and Your, your hearts are full of robbery, of, of pillage, plunder, and rape. That's what he's saying. Because they are not Jews inwardly. Um, that was his criticism of them. Um, says, there's going to be nothing that will not be concealed. The, the light will reveal all. Um, <clears throat> so nobody gets away with anything. That's a truth that we've had to live with our lives. We, we know, as you come to know God, He knows it all. We can't pretend, we can't hide anything from us, from Him, at all. And especially in a prayer time, it's going to come up as a believer. Right? Yeah. As I study, it's so convicting, I have to repent so many times of things. Studying His Word, it just does that. And I think about the work of the Holy Spirit we're, we're going to get to the Holy Spirit, but thinking of His work in just studying the Word, how it brings to mind when, when Christ is the center of all things, it's like I don't have to do a list of, you know, I've got to do this, this, this. As I study His Word and start to pray, if things aren't right in my life and confessed and repented and having my attitude adjustment back to him I, I'm at a loss it's like God I'm I'm worthless here I'm 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 wasting my time that's the reality of it because I I get distracted we all get distracted um, and I just was this week with something else I got distracted and the Lord gets in the words wake up here this is what it's about it's like Lord forgive me Homo legato, oh, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to say the same thing as what your truth says. I'm wrong. I'm a sinner. Get me back in. You've died for me. Jesus has paid that price. Okay, that, that's an honoring of God. You know that he sees everything. There's nothing that is hidden. Uh -huh. Then he goes on, verse 2, or verse 4. Well, just looking at verse 3, it's like, whatever you have whispered in the ear, in the inner room, in the, in the quietness, where you think you've got these deals going on, um, whispering, it's all going to be known. It's all going to be unrevealed. Uh, revealed. So many verses about that. Of um, Jesus has already talked about it in Luke, how um, that light's going to come in and... and penetrate everything. When he shows up, all is revealed. All people are held accountable to him. And then in verse 4, he says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Now he brings this up because the Pharisees, anybody that follows a religion is doing it for men, if not for themselves, self-glorification, um, to present themselves as being good, the giver, and wonderful, and compassionate, hospitable, all these things, they're doing it in the sight of men. And Jesus has said, they go out, they pray in front of all these people, and then when they give their tithes, it's the trumpet time, you know? It's the show, the spotlight, 
how great I am and I'm doing this. And Jesus said, don't worry about what men think. And don't even think about them killing you. Don't worry about death. Um, Because the worst they can do is kill you. They can't do anything more than kill you. Um, And here he's saying, God, fear him because after that death, he can then send you to hell. Um, So he's taking it further than just death. And for us, we look at that and it's like, yeah, the worst they can do to me is kill me. Those who do not believe. And yet, for us as believers, that's a promotion. (laughs) We are in the presence of God with him. And, but he's warning these people, he's warning them, you know, don't worry about what men think. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't worry. But worry about God. Because he is the God of hell. Because when I think of the God of hell, I think of Satan right away. Number one, Satan is not the God of hell. He's being cast into hell. Okay? God of hell is, this is his created lake of fire. Seems so unfair, doesn't it? But God is perfectly fair. And that's his justice called out. His condemnation for those who will not turn to him. And he's saying this is reality. And you need to come to the one, God the Father, and honor him. And you should have fear of him. And actually the word for hell is uh, Guiana. Um, Have you heard that before? Guiana. And it means um, the... uh, I think of the first part is uh, Valley of Fear. It's actually a place right outside of Jerusalem um, in the southwest. It was it was an area where in the Old Testament let me get, get my notes here. Valley it, it's the Valley of Hinnom. That's the actual name. Valley of Hinnom. And it's an area southwest of Jericho right out there. Uh, Jerusalem, right outside. And this is where the Jews were worshiping idols. And it was called the place of Tof- Tophet, which means spitting out and vomiting. They built altars of sacrifice. It was a fire pit. They poured wood in there. And even Ahaz and Manasseh, who were kings, Old Testament kings, they had sacrificed their children in there. And they were giving their children up to the god Moloch, to an idol called Moloch, false god. And that's in Second Chronicles 28 and 33. And Jeremiah talks about this also, um, that there would be a divine judgment on this wickedness. And he renamed it the Valley of Slaughter. That's Jeremiah 32, 35. Um, And other people follow the way of Moloch and the Baal of sacrifice and children, um, which was abhorrent to God. He, was, he called his people out of that pagan uh, worshiping. Um, but in Second King, Second Kings 23, King Josiah, who was a good king, he was God-fearing, uh, he put forth reforms on the nation He stopped all the idol worship and he turned that area into the city's dump and started a continual fire there where people would bring their waste and throw it in there and it would just continually, continually burn. And so that is when he uses the word, or the Jews use the word Ghana, they're like, oh yeah, the fire pit over there that never ends. It's constantly consuming, smoking, and is everlasting. And so that is the vision for them. They can just look at the valley right there. And that is Diana, and it's representing hell. 
And so you want to escape hell, honor the Father. And yes, I tell you, fear him. And the third thing here in, in verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. So not only does God see all things that go on in the world, not only does he have the power to cast in hell, but he also knows all things. And he cares about all things. And he even cares about the sparrows. Sparrows, this is the worthless little tiny bird. I remember my uncle wanting to shoot the sparrows to keep them away from the bird feeder to keep the other birds there. Um, and the blackbirds, they were ones. But the little tiny sparrows, I always found them really cute. But really, they were small and worthless and actually they were the cheapest of, uh, of any type of meat. Imagine the meat on a sparrow. But yet the poor would eat the sparrow because there was some meat and you could buy them for two, two pennies. Um, I guess that's a one-sixteenth of a day's wage. So you could buy quite a few um, sparrows if you were that hungry. But it's like God cares about all those little sparrows and in Matthew... Uh, where is it? Matthew 10.27 He not only knows about all the sparrows, he knows every hop they make. Okay, Every skip, hop. He knows everything. He, kn he knows everything. He doesn't have to come to the knowledge. He doesn't have to learn anything. He knows it. He created it all. And he knows everything that happens. And he even knows the hair on your head. You know how many, what, what the average amount of hair is on a person's head? 150,000 average. So you take that times 6 billion people, and our hair is changing all the time, and God knows it all. He knows it all. Vast. He knows everything. And here's the thing here. He, he's saying, God, God knows it all. He, he knows all. All we do, he knows, he knows our sin, he knows everything, and yet he cares. We fear, and, and, and this is the way to approach God, is to fear God, and once you come to him, then he says, fear not. That, that's the amazing thing about his word. It's like, Fear him. He is, he is all-powerful, sovereign, Lord of justice, and is worthy of all honor, all glory, all righteousness. And we come before him as, as, as sinful natures of wrath. And he's like, listen to me. I want you to fear me. And when you fear him and come to him, then he says, fear not. That was Jesus. He's like Peter. When Peter dropped to, to the ground and said, Lord, get away from me. I do not deserve to be in your presence. He says, stand up, Peter. I mean, it's that thing. He draws you close. Once you fear him, then he brings you close. And we see that in the book of Malachi. I'm just thinking of the last. <clears throat> Malachi is a prophet of justice. And it's the last prophet here before we get to the New Testament. And the whole thing is just judgment, judgment, judgment. The day of the Lord. Uh, chapter 3. In chapter 3, you just see, See, I'll send my messenger who will prepare the way before me, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, 
the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come. Um, but who can endure that day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire, a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Um, verse 5, So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against all those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice, but do not fear me. Um, and he goes on and on through this. Uh, until you get down to um, chapter 16. There in verse 16 it says, Then those who feared the law, Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. They're like, what about us? We feared the Lord. What, what's going to happen to us? And the Lord heard them, and then it says, A scroll of remembrance was written in His presence, concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. And what does He say? They'll be mine. They'll be mine. That's why it says, I'll care for the sparrow. I care for you even more. I, I will care for you if you fear me. And I will spare you. Um, let's see. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. So he's saying, there are those people who fear me, there's no need for fear. Because Israel, as they're watching the judgment on their nation through the years, can't imagine what they're thinking for those who serve God. But I know they were at peace because God spoke to them and said, you'll be okay. Through this whole thing, I'm going to protect you. Just like Daniel. Just like uh, the three. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thank you. Yes, exactly. So he's saying you, you have nothing to fear for you if you are warned and seek me out. Well, I'm going to stop there because the next part is about Christ. He says if, if you're going to honor the Father, you have to honor the Son, and that is the crux of Christianity right there, of honoring the Son. And as I hear people who have confessed Christ and talk so loosely about Him and joke, it just makes me shudder sometimes. I don't know if you've ever... People just use Jesus loosely and uh, make comments I, don't even, I can't do that with my Lord. <laughs> because He's our Lord, our Savior, our Messiah, our King. Um, I've died. I live for Him. And, and so to call yourself a Christian is a form of hypocrisy and not have a regard for Christ, um, the Savior. Um, you've never experienced that with people talking loosely about Jesus making fun no it's, it's revolting but it makes me sad it's like you don't please know him <laughs> please know him because he's the only way to the father and then the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals him to us and he's the one agent of making it alive, us alive to Christ and revealing everything to us. So to honor God is to honor Jesus. And he will go in depth with that in uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which has uh, made more sense to me 
is, especially through Luke here, of understanding. All that's been revealed about Jesus. And Jesus says, you know, you can, you can reject my saying, but when the Holy Spirit comes and pushes you to accept me and you reject it, there's no sin offering for that. I can't die for you rejecting me. That's what he's saying. Um, these passages have helped me in understanding who Christ is, that he, he has to be the consumption of our life. Um, and when I talked about distractions this week, I, I got distracted in the worldly thing of focusing on something else and God just, it's like, look at me, look at me. I want you to look upon me and see me. And when I do that, it's like everything else just dims. It dims. Um, that's how you know you're serving the true Lord. I, my life is still a mess. I still, I look at it and I think, uh, I'm not serving in this way. Lord, uh, forgive me for this, for this. And yet, don't take that away from me of who he, knowing who Jesus is because that, that turns all of our life in his direction when he's that centerpiece, right? Um, and so I love coming here to be encouraged by the saints, and I hope you are encouraged as well. This is, um, this is the truth behind following Christ. Follow, I want to follow Him. I want to follow Him and know Him. And may you do that even more this week. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the warnings of understanding what it means to be a hypocrite and not participate in that. To turn our back on other religion uh, as far as their influence on our life. Father, we do not turn our back on, to in, on people who are in other religions. We reach out to them to show them Christ. But as far as their influence on us, Father, I've learned to just shut it off. Cut it off. Um, Father, may we know that walking with you, fearing you, that, that is the revealing of our new nature, that we are walking with Christ, we know him, hear him, and we know you, that you hear us, that as we pray to you, your will will be done. And we know your will is a part of our life, that we follow you and entrust you with all things. Father, lead us this week and may we declare the excellencies of who you are and reveal Jesus to others through our life, our mannerisms, our prayers, and our compassion with other people. In Jesus' wonderful name, everyone said, Amen. Amen.